Hello everyone, uh, once again I welcome you all to MSB lecture series on transmetallic chemistry. This lecture is 57th in the series, after this one another 3 are left. So, in this one let me begin discussion on NMR spectroscopy as I had mentioned I am not going to the details of NMR spectroscopy, but I would make you efficient in interpreting NMR data of uh, multinuclear system whether it is 1H13C, 19F or any other NMR active nuclei. So, let us begin with first slide. So, first slide I have given some reference books if you are more interested in learning about nuclear magnetic resonance you can refer to some of these books these are all very wonderful books and you can get wealth of information from these books please read and try to understand more about uh, NMR spectroscopy. So, NMR is the most powerful tool available for organic and inorganic uh, synthetic chemists not only for uh, organic and inorganic biochemists, material chemists, environmental chemists in fact all those who use chemicals NMR is the most powerful tool uh, to characterize those compounds and also to determine the structure. It is used to study a wide variety of nuclei for example, 1 H 13 C, 15 nitrogen, 15 nitrogen, 19 F, 31 P and many others. This periodic table shows all possible elements which have NMR active nuclei, plenty of them are NMR active in fact we can do NMR studies for most of these elements uh, having isotopes which are NMR active of course they may vary all of them are not 100 percent but some of them are 100 percent or some of them are in trace quantities some of them in 20 30 percent. So, what we have to understand first is which are the nuclei which exhibit NMR. So, that means let us consider nuclei containing even numbers of both protons and neutrons have nuclear spin i equals 0 and therefore, cannot undergo NMR. That means, if you consider any nucleus having even number of protons and even number of neutrons they have nuclear spin i equals 0 and therefore, cannot be used for NMR purposes. For example, if you consider 4 helium, 12 carbon, 16 oxygen or 32 sulfur. How about odd odd that means, nuclei with odd number of both protons and neutrons have spin quantum number that are positive integers. For example, if you consider 14 n nuclear spin i equals 1, if you consider 2 h deuterium i equals 1 and also if you consider 10 boron i equals 3. So, these are all having odd number of uh, protons and odd number of neutrons and they are NMR active. Rest of the nuclei having odd even or even odd combination of protons and neutrons have half integral values for nuclear spin example 1 H i equals half and 17 oxygen i equals 5 by 2 if you consider 19 F i equals 1 by 2, 23 sodium i equals 3 by 2 and 31 P i equals half and many more. So, that means here if you consider these are all even even NMR inactive whereas odd odd and all rest of them odd even or even odd combination of protons and neutrons are all NMR active and of course, one should know how much such isotopes are present. So, this one clearly gives you some idea about different type of nuclear spin we come across among elements in this periodic table. You can see all those indicated in red color have I equals half and those which are in yellow color have I equals 3 by 2 and blue 7 by 2 and then this orange 1 for lithium and uh, nitrogen you can see and also those in green color they have I equals 5 by 2 and this in purple or violet they have 9 by 2. So, that means you can see uh, majority of elements do possess nuclei having NMR active I values. So, what is nuclear spin? A nucleus with an odd atomic number or an odd mass number has a nuclear spin. Now, it is very clear from my previous slide nucleus with an odd atomic number or an odd mass number possess a nuclear spin and the spinning charged nucleus generates a magnetic field that is true this information you must have learned from physics also any charged species generates a magnetic field when in its circular 
motion. So, for example, if you take if you consider nucleus as a tiny bar magnet and if you keep in a magnetic field they can see it can be aligned with the magnetic field or it can oppose the magnetic field. So, that means spinning protons what happen the moment you put into they have haphazard way of arrangement the moment you put them in a magnetic field they are all aligned some of them are aligned with the field some of them are aligned opposite the field. So, that means here a loop of current is generated here I. So, that means when placed in a magnetic field spinning protons act like bar magnets I mentioned you it is in the absence of magnetic field in the absence of uh, in the presence of magnetic field what happens some of them can be aligned in this way they have lower energy and more stable some of them can be aligned in this fashion and they have high energy and they are less stable. In fact, you can convert this one to this one by supplying energy equivalent to the energy gap between these two levels. So, you can see here two energy states you can think of alpha state and beta state in alpha state nuclei have aligned with the field whereas in beta state higher energy they have aligned in against or opposite to the applied field and the energy difference is given by h nu equals del E and if you supply the energy equivalent to this one this can go to this one here. The magnetic field of the spinning nuclei will align with either the external field or against the field. A photon with the right amount of energy can be absorbed and cause the spinning proton to flip. So, it is very simple you try to imagine the spinning nucleus like a top you must have played with in childhood or someone may be playing even now. So, this is something like this the top is there and it, if it is rotating like this what happens when it is rotating steadily and looks almost static ok when it is a perfectly balanced top it will be rotating and it appears like it is standing sometimes they say top is uh, sleeping ok yes in that case what happens and now let us assume the applied magnetic field is in this direction along this axis of this top and then you apply another energy in this direction energy. So, well, so, for example, you start playing a top and then try to touch it at like this perpendicular to that one what happens it starts wobbling. So, when the frequency of this one is uh, suitable then what happens it, it will turn something like this it will eventually it will wobble wobble and it becomes like this that is what exactly happens in that case ok. So, this is called flipping that means that much energy it already gained when we supplied in the form of a photon in the radio frequency region. So, now let us look into the relationship in with this energy gap and the magnetic field strength. So, this is energy difference is proportional to the magnetic field strength the energy gap is proportional to the magnetic field strength that means energy gap can be increased by increase in the magnetic field strength it can be decreased by decreasing the magnetic field strength. Now, that is given by this equation delta E equals h nu equals this is gamma uh, or rho h over 2 pi into B naught. So, this term is called gyromagnetic ratio it is the ratio of its magnetic moment to its angular momentum I am referring with respect to the nucleus. So, now gyromagnetic ratio is a constant for each nucleus it is characteristic of each nucleus it will vary from one nucleus to another one and then for proton this is 26753 per second per gauss for hydrogen and a 60 megahertz proton is required to flip a proton that means a 60 megahertz photon is required to flip a proton in a 14092 gauss field that means if you keep a hydrogen or a proton in a magnetic field strength of 14092 gauss field to flip it the spin like this to become like this or to go to higher energy you have to supply a photon equivalent to 60 megahertz that is what this equation is telling you. So, what is now we have to look into another term important term called magnetic shielding what is it? if all protons absorb the same amount of energy in a given magnetic field not much information could be obtained. That means, if you consider a, a molecule such as ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol or acetaldehyde or anything if all hydrogens absorb the same amount of energy to go to excited level then probably NMR would not have been useful tool for determining the structure. 
that means how it is different. So, but protons are surrounded by electrons that shield them from the external field. So, that means when you place a, a molecule in a magnetic field, of course, if we have NMR active nuclei, what happens? The flipping of nucleus takes place. Uh, when it is taking place under the influence of a certain magnitude of magnetic field strength, you should remember that we are not putting naked proton or naked nucleus without any electron. Since they are surrounded by electrons, okay, they also generate a magnetic field. Okay. So, that means the magnetic field generated by surrounding electrons varies from one nucleus to another one. As a result, what happens? They require a different amount of energy for flipping that is called precision frequency. The circulating electrons create an induced magnetic field that opposes the external magnetic field. As a result, what happens? That magnetic field experienced by nuclei would vary. So, magnetic field strength must be increased for a shield proton to flip at the same frequency. For example, let us say applied magnetic field strength is B naught and because of uh, the electrons circulating surrounding the nucleus under magnetic field, they also generate a magnetic field. So, that opposes the applied magnetic field as a result that net magnetic field experienced by nucleus drops. In that case what happens? If the radio frequency is fixed, then what you have to do is you have to supply uh, whatever the induced magnetic field generated by electron equivalent to that one. So, in that case what happens again resonance occurs, you should remember. So, that means in order to flip that one at the same frequency, okay, there are two options are there. I can decrease the radio frequency for flipping on the other hand we keep that one constant. Instead what we do is we will try to match the loss of magnetic field by supplying extra magnetic field. So, that is what we do. So, magnetic field strength must be increased. So, B naught must be increased for a shielded proton to flip at the same frequency. So, for example, if you take here, this is a 60 megahertz it absorbs for flipping under the influence of B naught equals 14092 gauss. This is a naked proton and if it is a shielded proton what happens? Net magnetic field the experience will be less because the magnetic field generated by the circulation of electron density would oppose. So, then B naught will be B naught minus B i net magnetic field experienced by if I say the induced magnetic field say is B i resultant magnetic field experienced by the nucleus will be B naught minus B i. So, now whatever the B i is there equivalent to B i we have to supply magnetic field. So, that resonance frequency remains same. So, that is what we do in each case and in some cases what happens in case of D shielding we have to decrease it or we have to increase the frequency. This is how the shielding influences. So, magnetic field strength must be increased for a shielded proton to flip at the same frequency. Stronger applied field compensates for shielding. So, that means whatever the balancing should be added so that the, the absorption frequency remains same. So, here I have given this. Uh, radio frequency for different magnetic fields 14,100 is 60 megahertz this is, with this is with respect to hydrogen and 23,500 is 100. So, this how we have a 60 megahertz NMR, 100 megahertz NMR, 200 megahertz NMR, 250, 400, 500, 600 or even we have 1000 megahertz NMR now. So, now what would happen protons in a molecule depending among, upon their chemical environment are shielded are de shielded essentially they will be shielded by different amounts. For example, if you consider a simple molecule such as methanol, if you see here the electron density on hydrogen is pulled, you know that H is now almost like H plus, less electron density is there, it is less shielded. So, absorbs at a lower field, whereas here they are more shielded, they absorb at a higher field. So, now this is how they have shielding and de shielding makes the signals appear at different places as a result what happens each functional group or each group is unique. So, that NMR is very helpful in determining the structure. So, now the number of signals indicate 
different kinds of protons present in a molecule. If you take ethanol for example, ethyl alcohol we have CH3, CH2OH, we get 3 signals that indicates 3 different kinds of protons are present in the molecule. Okay. The location of the signal shows whether the proton is shielded or deshielded. One is it gives number of signals, indicates number of a set of protons available and then it will give the location of the signal indicates whether they are shielded or deshielded. Accordingly, we can arrange them in the sequence or the intensity of the signal shows the number of protons of the type. Now, the intensity of the signal also tells in each group how many protons are there and signal splitting shows the number of protons on adjacent atoms. Now, the splitting would tell you how many are there in the neighborhood in the next position or in the adjacent on adjacent atom. So, that means here it is this NMR signal would give you all this information. First it would give you the number of uh, different kind of protons present and the location in would indicate whether the proton is shielded or deshielded. Again the intensity would indicate number of protons of that type are present for example, CH3, CH2OH if you consider ethanol in CH3 3 are there and CH2 2 are there and OH 1 is there that information comes from intensity and then splitting. Splitting would tell you CH3 is next to CH2 and CH2 is in between CH3 and OH and OH is that other end next to that one only CH2 is there. So, something like that this information all information comes from NMR signals this is how it becomes very easy to interpret the structure and determine the structure ultimately. Okay. This is the NMR spectrometer. So, this is the magnet. magnet ok uh, a B naught whatever we tell. So, sample is inserted here and then a detector will be there and radio frequency will be applied here and then the signals would come a detector is there and it will be you know then whatever the detector detects and then absorption will be shown on a recorder plot like this. And this one this is the B naught B we say B is the applied magnetic field. So, it is always in the increasing applied magnetic field is plotted in the direction and absorption will be in this one in this axis. So, let us consider methanol graph here you can see this is how methanol NMR spectrum appears like this and now this one three these three protons are represented by this one here and then here the small one is due to H. So, that means if the moment you see in this one you can see a more shielded higher field low frequency shift for these things whereas, this one less shielded this H is less shielded and lower field high frequency shift. That means, uh, you can classify. So, when it is deshielded we call it as of course, here if we, if we have used TMS as a standard I would tell you uh, it is 0 with respect to that one these signals are assigned the chemical shifts. So, this is less shielded it is appearing left side and it is lower field that is also called down field shift and then high frequency shift. Whereas, here once it comes on the right side it is more shielded these three and higher field and then low frequency shift. So, now let us look into tetramethylene. So, this is the structure of tetramethylene this is called TMS it is added to the sample. Why it is added to the sample this is added as a reference since silicon is less electronic than carbon TMS protons are highly shielded they are highly shielded because of so much electron ok density. So, signal defined as 0 whatever the signal it shows that is calibrated to 0 value. And now, uh, we are recording NMR spectrum uh, 1 H NMR for all molecules using this as a standard. So, organic protons absorb downfield to the left of the TMS signal most of the organic protons they absorb downfield to the TMS signal that means, 0 if it is here everything will be coming towards positive side 0 to 10 or sometime more. Okay. So, what is chemical shift? Chemical shift is measured in parts per million I shall tell you why it is measured in parts per million why not in hertz ratio of shift downfield from TMS to total spectrometer frequency will give you chemical shift in parts per million or the displacement of magnetic resonance frequency of a sample nucleus from that of a reference nucleus. For example, this is the same value when you determine chemical shift in parts per million it is independent of magnetic field strength. So, that is the reason we measure in parts per million ok. Uh, whether you measure in 60 megahertz, 100 megahertz or 300 megahertz it does not change. This is called delta scale whenever we write 
we use this term delta. Now, this is the delta scale I have given. I have again defined here what is chemical shift. Chemical shift in ppm is called delta. Either you have to write delta or ppm. There is no need to write both. The moment you write delta, it is understood that it is in ppm or if you write it ppm, it is understood it is delta scale. This is the ratio of shift downfield from TMS. That means, whatever the value that NMR spectrum shows, that one in hertz divided by spectrometer frequency will give you chemical shift in parts per million. For example, you can see here. Uh, 10 ppm for 600 megahertz divided by 10. So, here it goes like that and similarly in case of uh, this is in case of 60 megahertz if you go for 300 megahertz also you can see uh, it is a 10 300 3000 divided by 300 or here 600 divided by 60. So, this is how for convenience to keep the NMR signal value constant irrespective of in which magnetic field we are measuring. So, it is given in delta scale or ppm. So, location of signals now. So, I have given some more electronegative atoms D shield more and give larger shift values. For example, you can see here values I have given and then effect decreases with distance, effect decreases with distance, distance between two groups. Additional electronegative atoms cause increase in chemical shift. For example, you can see here alkane CH3 would appear around 0.9 and all Cane CH2 will appear around 1.3 and if you go for CH tertiary carbon appears at 1.4 and in case of this one when I have a CO group it appears at 2.1 and alkyne uh, proton appears at 2.5. If you have a halide then CH2 appears around 3 to 4 and if you have something like this, this one appear at 5 to 6 and then if you have a double group and then CH3 it appears at 1.7 and uh, aromatic groups appear around 7.2, a phenyl, a methyl group on phenyl group appears around 2.3, aldehydic group hydrogen appears around 9 to 10, carboxylic proton appears 10 to 12 and alcohol value around 2 to 5 and aryl alcohol H will be around 4 to 7 and amine will be 1.5 to 4. So, this the range is given again there is a significance in uh, giving the range. So, now aromatic protons why they are so much D shielded? Let us look into it. The value is around 7 to 8. If you assume this our benzene group say it is placed like this and with respect to the applied magnetic field, then what happens induced magnetic field because of circulation of uh, this delocalized electrons would generate a ring current that generates a magnetic field that is aligned with the magnetic field. If it is aligned with the magnetic field, what happens? It is more D shielded and it appears at higher frequency. So, that means here we call it when it is aligned with we say induced magnetic field is reinforces the external field as a result it is de-shielded. The net magnetic field experienced by the nucleus is B naught plus B i, not B naught minus B i, B naught plus B i as a result what happens? The radio frequency has to be increased. In this case either you have to decrease the magnetic field if we cannot do it we have to increase the radio frequency. That is the reason they are up here you get D shielded region we call high frequency shift for the same reason. In case of vinyl protons same explanation can be given they appear on 5 to 6. So, induced field reinforces, but induced field generated here is in magnitude less than what we saw in case of acetylene. Now, in case of acetylene proton what happens it comes around 2.5. So, induced one is considerably less compared to those two groups here. In case of aldehydic protons it is even more because of electronegative oxygen atom present here as a result what happens it appears around 9 to 10. It shifts it is much more de shielded and it is high frequency shift. And then OH and NH signals it is very important chemical shift here depends on concentration and hydrogen bonding in concentrated solutions de shield the protons. So, signal is around 3.5 for NH and around 4.5 for OH. This is very, very important. If hydrogen bonding is there, how the chemical shift is affected? So, that means if due to the hydrogen bonding in concentrated solution that de shield the proton so that it goes around NH proton would appear around 3.5 and OH proton would appear around 4.5. So, proton exchange between the molecules broaden the peak. Another example is for example, these, these are very acidic, they can readily exchange. So, take this one and keep it in deuterium solvent and if it completely disappears and you may not see 
next day when you run NMR OH signal that indicates that you have a OH. So, that means you take this one freshly record NMR in CDCL3 or D2O and then leave it for 24 hours after that one all OH have become OD in that case this signal due to this H up disappears because in case of OH you have OD. So, that indicates your compound has OH same thing is true in case of NH also. So, if sometime confirming the presence of NH is very critical you can do this exchange process record freshly prepared sample and identify where NH signal is coming leave it for 24 hours all NH becomes ND and then take NMR this is missing. So, that indicates you have NH and of course, you can also confirm these things from IR spectroscopy by looking into OH stretching frequency that should be different OD will be there now. So, now carboxylic acid proton would come around 10 ok. So, you can see here in this one this is for CH3 and this is for OH is shown here ok. And number of signals you can see how many signals are there 1, 2, 3 signals are there because we have 1, 2, 3 are there and relative chemical shifts also shown here for example, this one is around 2.25 and this is 3.41 and this is 3.36 that means you can say relatively to what extent they are de shielded with respect to this 0 value of TMS. Now, let us come to the intensity of signals if you consider this molecule here we have these 3 are equivalent. So, we have 9 protons and here we have 3 protons. So, when we get 2 signals, so signal due to this one should have intensity 3 and then intensity of this one should be a 9. So, now that means it is 1 is to 3 you can see here the space taken is 2 spaces 2 and then 6 spaces it is taken. So, that means 1 is to 3, 1 is to 3 means it is 3, 1 is to 3 is there. So, this is how the intensity of the signal will tell you how many identical or equivalent are there then and now we can say without any problem yes there are 3 methyl groups are there and they are all on the same carbon atom. So, that means this uh, quaternary carbon can be identified here the other one is also shifted little bit if oxygen is next to CH3 group. So, you should be able to tell it is an ether something like that. So, intensity of the signal I told you show by integral trace this is called integral trace that will give you. So, number of equivalent protons present in a given molecule. So, now how many hydrogens ok when the molecular formula is known each integral rise can be assigned to a particular number of hydrogens that is what I showed you here you can see here for example, here 1, 2 uh, they are all these two are identical 4 type of protons are there then we have 4 signals are there and the ratio if you consider this is 1 is to 2 is to 3 is to 6 that means here 0.5 is to 1 is to 1.5 is to 3. So, that means basically very nicely it will tell you how many similar type of protons are there then segregating them as groups and then adding at appropriate place to arrive at the correct structure to understand it so would be very easy. So, now let us come to spin spin splitting. So, non equivalent protons and adjacent carbon have magnetic fields that may align with or oppose the magnetic field. So, now let us look into for example, if we take CH3 CH2 OH, CH3 is there and CH2 is there and OH is there and CH2 is adjacent carbon and two hydrogens are there and how this adjacent hydrogen atoms influences the signal of CH3 and same way how CH2 get influenced by CH3 protons that we have to see that means we should remember when we are looking into the signal around CH3. CH2 also generates a magnetic field those two protons and they can also be aligned with the magnetic field or oppose the magnetic field and depending upon that one this signal will be split. So, this magnetic coupling causes the proton to absorb slightly higher down field when the external field is reinforced and slightly up field when the external field is opposed that means now instead of giving one signal it may show 3, 4 or 5 signals and then we have to see what are the intensities and then after understanding one or two molecules what we should do is we should try to make it a generate general. So, that every time we should not calculate the moment we look into a molecule we should be able to tell how many lines will be there, how many signals will be there and how it is split that we call it as spin spin splitting. So, all possibilities exist so signal is split here. So, let us look into one example quickly. So, now let us look into 112 tribromomethane. So, non equivalent protons and adjacent carbons are there now these two are different from this one. So, now let us look into the signal of these two signal of these two will be influenced by this one that means let me write here this is the applied magnetic field. So, B naught 
I am looking into this H B, H B is there and H B yes it should give a signal and now what happens if H B is something like this, now we have H is there H A, how it is going to influence, H A would influence in this fashion for example, it can be aligned in this way with the this one, okay. this is our uh, uh, together and now or it can be aligned something like this. So, as a result what happens one is here, one is here, this is low, so we get one signal and one signal in 1 is to 1. So, this is how it is. On the other hand, so basically it would be something like this, it can be aligned with the magnetic field, uh, th this one when we are talking about HB signal or it can be opposite. So, that means uh, now it is influenced by two protons, one with the field, one the due to the neighboring one. So, with this, this one will give one signal, this one will give one signal, one is to one, we get a doublet here. Now, this is a triplet, how it is coming here? So, now uh, we have something like this, two are there, both of them can be aligned with the magnetic field. Now, one can be aligned like this, one can be aligned like this and this is true for this one also, here we can have two arrangements. Now, this can be aligned like this and this can be aligned like this and now both of can both of them can be aligned in this fashion. Now, what happens? Now, 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, 3 this is coming, this is 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, this one is for this one. So, now this one under the influence of these two here, what happens? It will be split into 3 with the intensity ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, this is how we can understand. Now, it becomes very easy to write. For example, if the formula is given simply say C2 H3 Br3 if it is given and if the spectrum is given here and you should be able to write the correct structure here. So, this is how we can use NMR very effectively with okay, molecular formula, we should be able to write structural formula of looking into this one and analyzing and interpreting. As I mentioned here, I showed you uh, HA reinforces field this one for these two, one is in this direction, this H is aligned with the magnetic field, this signal and now this one is opposite, aligned in the direction opposite to the applied field because it can be, it can have spin like this or it can have spin like that when you are looking into the signal due to this one. So, two signals have come. Now, if you see the other one, now when we are looking to signal of this one, these two have two small magnets, they can be aligned like this here, they can be aligned like this here. Now, the field is increased, so high field strength. Now, one is like this and one is like this and other combination is like this. So, and now both of them are down. So, this one signal is coming here. So, intensity is 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, this is how NMR understanding is simplified by looking into the spin spin splitting. Then what happens? It becomes very tedious or laborious job to calculate how many signals are coming for each one every time you see. Sometime you may have 6 equivalent protons, 9 equivalent protons or 15 equivalent protons. Then what happens? It will be little bit cumbersome to understand or calculating every time. For that one, we have a simple rule here, a general rule that is called n plus 1 rule. If a signal is split by n equivalent protons, it is split into n plus 1 peaks. So, that means number of equivalent protons causing splitting 0 means 1 signal. In the neighboring you do not have anything means you get a singlet and if you have 1 you, should, you will get a doublet, if you have 2 you will get a triplet, if you have 3 you get a quadrat, if 4 are there you get quintet 4 plus 1 5. So, 5 plus 1 6, 6 plus 1 7, septet we get. Then to understand the relative ratio of these signals in a multiplet, we have to go for Pascal triangle. Pascal triangles will be unique for each nuclear spin. So, this one is for I equals half. The same Pascal triangle one cannot use, one should not use for I equals 1 or I equals 3 by 2, I equals 3. You have to write separate Pascal triangles first by writing the intensity of the first signal and you can continue writing. Now, this one is for nuclear spin I equals half. So, this is the Pascal triangle that can tell you 7 lines septet means the intensity of this 7 lines will be 1 is to 6 is to 15 is to 20 is to 15 is to 6. So, if you look into isopropyl alcohol, we can see that one. I will start my next lecture interpreting the NMR spectrum of isopropyl alcohol or isopropanol. So, until then have excellent time understanding NMR. Thank you for your kind attention.